Welcome to the events for this evening. It's great to see so many of you. It's my very great pleasure, my name is Peter McCann, to be your guide during the course of this evening. And so to our first short film on Sierra Leone. But just before we watch it, I'm delighted to say that we have with us the incredibly talented Lucy Lee, who created the animation, so she's here with us this evening. And it therefore seemed an unmissable opportunity for us to talk to her for just a moment about how she came to make the films in the way she has. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lucy Lee. with the technology here? Thank you. Oh, good. That's good. <laughs> what were the practical uh, problems in making this film? We, um, I had, um, the access I had to Oscar was via WhatsApp, so I interviewed her <laughs> via WhatsApp. Um, um, we, we took that approach because it was a more practical uh, approach, but um, it's actually quite hard to, to get to the bottom of somebody's story and to really connect with somebody and to really get their trust um, and really understand them and their story and their motivation and their history um, interviewing someone that way. So, um, so you never saw her face to face? I've never met her face to face. No, because you didn't go to see her, you weren't able to go to see her earlier. No, no. Much easier. And also she was studying, she's studying, so there yeah. were times where she, she wasn't able to kind of respond directly and there were times when I was working on other things and not able to respond directly. So uh, over a period of uh, two or three months, we. We, we had a conversation about what's that, well, we, where we got to know each other and I got to know her. So what is it that Sierra Leone actually needs now? Well, I'm going to get some help on this because I would like the, uh, uh, the, the Chief Executive of uh, the Steve Sinner Foundation to come up here and join me, ladies and gentlemen, and be <laughs> Right. Um, well, the teachers that we've spoken to in Sierra Leone have asked for us to help them develop uh, a learning resource centre there, and um, so we said that we will do that. What exactly is a learning resource centre? Good What's question. Um, a learning resource centre is different um, in each place because it depends on what the actual need is in the country that we're working in. I think uh, the thing that uh, we really need help with is um, resource provision. So if there's any teachers with any spare time on your hands, don't all put your hands up at once. <laughs> um, we would love some help supporting teachers to develop resources. Um, we obviously need funds, so fundraising. We've had some fantastic people over the last year that have been swimming for us and running for us. Um, I've got um, a couple of swimmers there in the audience this evening. And um, as the evening will go on, you will see that it doesn't have to be about teaching. There are people who've used their voice and sung for us to support us. And also, I think it's very much about reciprocal learning. So please keep telling us your stories, because we want to share um, stories around the world. We've got a lot to learn from each other. And I can still tell the story to me. I'll never forget it, because it's such a significant story. And he told the story when he came back from, I think it was Botswana year or wasn't married, but he came back into the office and he told me the story about how he'd been talking to some children in Botswana or wherever it was, a country in Africa. And they come up to him with terrific excitement and they said, Mr. Steve, Mr. Steve, is it true that in your country there are children who don't want to go to school? And they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that there would be a country in the world where there would be children who didn't want to go into school. There would be children who would be prepared to play truant. And he was so thrilled by the idea and so excited by the eagerness and the enthusiasm of those children for knowledge, for awareness, for learning. And that's what we're about. Is that a good story to tell? That's a very good story. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, we've been working with um, uh, an organisation in the UK called Manisha UK, 
and also um, an organisation called Manisha Nepal. And they have um, started developing a learning resource centre there already. Um, we have a potential building which needs some repairs. Um, and they are raising money there themselves. They've got like the Chamber of Commerce and different businesses involved. But I'm quite certain that we will be asked for some support for the resource there. Uh, well, um, in Haiti, we, uh, we, as I said in the film, we face different issues. Um, it's a poor country, and also we face natural disaster. And I think people don't give up, because um, even if um, we are facing a lot of disaster, people still uh, enjoying life. People still willing to move forward right after uh, the hurricane, right after the earthquake, uh, you will see like uh, um, restart again. People will restart to uh, go to work to enjoy life. And I think um, there is a part of the earthquake that people did not aware of. It's the heroism part of the earthquake because um, during the earthquake, you will see uh, wounded people carrying wounded people. You will see uh, people who are bleeding, helping other people. Uh, you will see, you would um, unexpectedly, if you went to this street uh, in the night of the effort, you would hear song, you would hear people singing, people uh, praying, um, people um, asking for hope. And we have a lot of people who are uh, Christian, who are believers, and God and other spirits, um, but they are asking for hope, they are uh, still want to celebrate life and to move forward. Education is something that in human, in the world we have in common. Uh, for example, if um, people are willing to help to support in what they believe in. For example, if you are Christian and a Christian organization come to you uh, for and tell you about what they're doing, and you will want to help them. If you're Muslim, and a Muslim organization come to you and tell you about what they're doing, you're more willing to help them. And, but um, I think when a foundation uh, are working on developing education in the world, it's something we have in common. It's not um, about if either we are Christian, Muslim, or whatever, but I think it's something we have in common and we should um, really sure show and turn. Sorry, I don't speak English for well. <laughs> we show interest in. Because uh, around the world, um, sorry, I go farther than your question. <laughs> 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 I don't know uh, Yeah, I was saying um, in the world, um, a lot of people are worrying about um, leaving wealth for the children, uh, leaving a okay, house, a car. And I think if people are um, wanting to support a little bit more education, a little bit more in stuff that we're coming, there will, it will be good also to think about leaving a better society for your children. Because um, you leave wealth for your children, you leave every material things for them, but if they live in a society that they don't feel secure, they don't feel safe, they feel um, that there's a lot of barriers, uh, I think that that's not very interesting to live in such society like this. So. Um, my name is Sam, and I think there is something about each of those fabulous stories and, and um, what Billie Jean was just talking about that's triggered me to talk about a story um, that I once wrote um, for Engage, which is the fabulous magazine of the Steve Smith Foundation, and if you haven't read it, it's just by the registration desk. Please get your hands on it. <laughs> yeah, so that's me done with my sales pitch, and I can get on with my story. Um, so some of my old friends and colleagues from the Steve Smith Foundation will probably remember this. Um, I am originally from India, and back in my young days, when I was in high school, I used to be very much involved in sort of student activism and working on sort of various social issues within the country. And I was part of a, a local street theatre group. So what we used to do is um, sort of do uh, folk media, street plays, 
uh, to raise awareness about various social issues, and obviously one of the big issues that we were working on was education, and particularly as the film from Nepal was talking about, gender equality in education, so equal access to um, education for both girls and boys. So there was this little play that we used to do um, across the town where I come from to raise awareness of gender equality in education. Um, and there was a little girl in that play, she used to play the character of a girl who doesn't go to school while her brother does. And that's what the play was all about and it kind of ended on a positive note when the girl's parents realised that it's as important for her to go to school as it is for her brother. However, in real life, that little girl had a similar story, a similar situation. She was from this little village where her parents, um, they were quite poor. They were sending their son to school, but they could not send her to school for economic reasons. And obviously for them, it did not make good economic sense to be investing in a girl's education because there's no return on that investment. And we all knew about that. We felt that that was absolutely wrong. I mean, she was playing the character of a girl who eventually ends up going to school and life sorted for her, but in her real life, that's not really happening for her. So we decided to go and talk to her parents, um, and obviously they said that, look, we're very poor, we can't really afford to send both kids to school, and faced with the choice, we'd rather send our son to school. Um, but we, we kind of persuaded them to send her to um, a non-formal education centre where they didn't really have to pay the fees, but she would get some access to education. So all of this was a long time ago. Um, and a few years ago when I was back in India um, on one of my breaks, I um, ended up getting in touch with some of the people who I used to work with when I was part of that street theatre group. Um, this was when the modern means of communication such as Facebook had emerged and we were able to get in touch with people long lost. Um, and we all kind of get together, got, got together and uh, all of us remembered that little girl. And, uh, we were really um, curious to find out what happened to her, you know. And she just made such a profound impression on all of us. Um, it, it was almost like she was very inspiring and we, were all, we all remembered her really well and we really wanted to find out what happened in her life later on. You know, she was, she was such an inspiring little girl and um, very strong, very, very... Um, very inspiring, um, and we decided that we'll try and get in touch with her parents and find out what happened. So we eventually traced down the village where she was from, um, which was a fast-growing town by that time. It had completely evolved into something else, and we were able to trace down her parents. And we went to her, went to them, and we asked them. We kind of introduced ourselves and said, "You may not remember us, but we were these kids from long ago. Your little girl used to work with us. We used to be in this street theatre group." And we were just really curious to find out what happened to, to her. She just left such an impression on all of us. Um, and we were kind of expecting that, you know, given where she was from and given her background, that uh, the most that could have happened was that she would probably be married by that time, you know, probably had a family somewhere. Um, and her father very proudly told us that she went on to do a degree in physics at one of the topmost universities in India. We were absolutely shocked. We were shocked and surprised and happy and really proud that maybe a little something that we did maybe made some difference to her life. Um, and I have since kept in touch with her. And eventually she went on to um, study at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology um, on a scholarship and has done wonderful things in her life, done, done lots of lots of good stuff. She's back in India now, uh, married, has a wonderful partner. I guess there's something about all of these stories and, and the one that I have just told that kind of brings home the message that there's that power in education to completely transform a person's life. I think this little girl is a story that can relate to so many little girls around the world and really just, just gives us the message of what is it that access to learning and it can enable people to do and how much change as you were Peter talking about initially you know, the change that can come about in a generation's time if everybody had that access. There is so much power in that education. Um, so that's my little story. And it, 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 it will never cease to inspire me. And I hope it's inspired some of us here today and it continues to inspire us to support the absolutely wonderful work that the Steve Smith Foundation does worldwide. That's wonderful story. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, I grew 
remember going to primary school and I loved it. Um, I was very excited, that was the feeling I had. And the smell, I'm not sure what that smell was. <laughs> whenever I go into a primary school, it's there. So I'm not sure whether it's the crayons, the plasticine, or small bodies rubbing together, but <laughs> that smell is there. And I loved mixing sand and water. Um, they were right next to each other, but we were asked not to mix the sand and water. I don't know why, but we were. And um, I never really understood that, but there you go, that's teachers for you. Um, <laughs> There was a huge piano um, in the room, and we used to sing songs around the piano, and I, I loved that. But the thing that was special about school for me was books. I loved reading, and even though I'm sure at age five I could not read, I took them books down from the shelf and poured over them. And as soon as I could, I got myself off to Cotley Road Library. I know one or two people in the audience will know where that is. And you could get books for free. Wow. I mean, we say now that children nowadays are ad addicted to their devices. Well, I was addicted to books and I still am. My first experience of sharing my love for reading was when I taught my dad to read and write. I was about eight or nine and I realised that he couldn't read. And he was a very brave man. Well, I thought he was brave. He was a scaffolder. And I didn't inherit his stomach for heights, um, so I always thought he was very brave. And we used to sit of an evening and read Ladybird books, and he used to write his name and his address out on a little piece of white paper, and used to stick that inside of his wallet. And um, when it got grubby, he used to rewrite that piece of paper. And at the time, I didn't realise how important that was for him and what a difference it made to his life, but I do now. Um, and, uh, he, you know, he was very inspirational to me. Um, my daughter, Hayley, um, her father is from Guyana, and I'm obviously Irish-British. Um, so Hayley has mixed race heritage. When she was born, her skin colour came as a bit of a shock to people. But not to me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and over the years, we had to overcome many people's prejudices. And I think the thing that gave me the strength to either bite those people back or ignore their ignorance was the love that my dad and my family had for myself and Hayley. And I think it's them sort of things, them experiences in your life, um, which define you as a human being. And that's one of the things that defined me. Um, back to the books. Very much like Sam's story, the next time that I taught somebody to read was in Sierra Leone. And he was a small boy called Dowder. And people in the village said that he was very... Um, stubborn, he was very naughty, you better watch him. But I saw something in that boy, he had a fire in his belly. He wasn't going to conform unless he believed in things. And the thing that I really enjoyed about him was that when he came out of school at the end of the day, he stripped off all his clothes and he would just climb trees and run around in his pants and bare feet. And he was a fantastic little boy. And for some reason, he chose me and asked me to teach him to read. And I was thinking, what? Teach him to read? I don't know if I'm going to do that. Phonics? What do I know about phonics? Anyway, we persevered and every evening we used to um, practice reading and do shared reading. And he was so frustrated. For a long time he was saying to me, I'm just not getting it, Anne. I'm not getting it. And then there was a point when he got it. And the joy on his face that he could actually read and he could read books will live with me for the rest of my life because you, I, I can't, you know, if I could put that in a bottle and sell it or give it away to people, I would because he will always be in my heart. Um, so that's a little bit about me. My experience working internationally has made me see that there are things that need to change. 
Girls and boys must have equal access to education. People should not have to change their religion to access education, nor should where they are born or who they are born to limit that access to education. When I first came to work for Steve Senate Foundation, I thought, oh dear, what on earth do I know about education? <laughs> um, oops, what am I going to do now? Well, I went to an MUT conference and I found myself in the Steve Senate Memorial Garden. And I found myself having a conversation with Steve Senate, who I'd never had the pleasure to meet. Um, and I said to him, you better help me out here because I have no idea what on earth I'm doing. <laughs> and maybe he did, in a funny way, because the last two years have been fairly productive. Um, in Haiti, we've opened up a learning resource centre. I'm really pleased to say that we have 300 teachers being trained there this year. 100 of them are going to do their Bachelor of Education. We're um, developing literacy with Cuban and Haitian teachers working together. As somebody mentioned earlier, we worked with um, other teacher unions around the world, Education International, Quebec Teachers Union, and we've now got the four teacher unions working on developing the Learning Resource Centre, working together in Haiti. Um, in Sierra Leone, um, our 12 teachers that we brought to the UK, each of them 12 teachers approximately, have supported and trained another 348 teachers, and that's had an impact on about 12,000 students, which is, you know, quite a crack at getting education right. And we also work in the UK as well. Um, we've got our Education for All project. We've got about 4,000 schools and community groups working on that. Um, and we very recently um, sponsored a competition in Hertfordshire where primary schools, um, you'll have to forgive me because I don't really understand it, but they did a robotics competition and it was nine primary schools and the idea was to get primary children, particularly girls, interested in robotics. And the children there who have um, used the kit are going to package that up and we're going to do some reciprocal learning with Haiti. They're going to send that as a resource and they're going to do some shared learning together. What I'd like to do now is um, give you an example of um, somebody who is a teacher but hasn't perhaps used her teaching skills um, to help the foundation. Um, she's used her voice, she's a brilliant singer, singer. And I'd like to ask if Adney quite great to come up and join us so she can give us an answer. If Adney's passion, as well as singing, is about um, making sure children can learn to read, and so she set up an organisation called Sing a Book, and she um, also produced our campaign song for the foundation. <laughs> thank you, Anne. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to the Steve Senate Foundation for giving me an opportunity to actually use my songwriting skills to actually write their campaign song. It really, really has been a pleasure for me and I'm really touched by it. Um, but not just that, the, the song isn't just about education for all around the world. It's a song that's gone around the UK as well. And what I really, really like about the Senate Foundation is that charity really does begin at home. So it allows children within our schools to actually experience what some of these children around the world experience and also give them an opportunity to realise how important education is. And it's interesting when uh, Graham talked about um, how um, the children in the country, of course, why not? He was saying they couldn't believe that children actually didn't want to learn. Um, and as a teacher, obviously that's something we're struggling with, because children are reluctant to learn. But I think when they see things like those beautiful films, your films are fantastic by the way, they're really, really lovely. When they see films like that, I think they begin to appreciate how privileged they are. 
that they have access to education. So I've been told I have to sing the song. Um, however, I don't. <laughs> um, but I would like everyone to join in. It's a really, really simple song. It's a simple tune. The words are going to come up on the board behind me. And I really, really would like everyone to, to join in um, and help me sing the song. And then when you've sung the song and you're going home and you're on the train, <laughs> which you will be doing, you're then going to go home, you're going to go to the Steve Sinnott Foundation website and they're going to download it and they're going to share it with your mum and your dad and your children and their niece and their grandchildren and you're just all going to be singing Education for All, a better place to be. So. Yeah. 